So thank you so much for joining us, Marcus, in what must have been the most memorable days of your life, but also the most tiring days of your life. Just talk us through the last 10 days. Yeah, it's uh, it's been crazy. It's been pretty full on, to be honest, since that uh, taking checkered flag on Sunday uh, on, of the 500. It was, uh, yeah, first of all, you know, you sort of struggle to realize what's happening, I think. And I, I still sort of, I think I still pinch myself to sort of make sure it's, it's real and not a dream. But, uh, but yeah, since, since Sunday afternoon, uh, it's been... Uh, it's been flat out. It's been every minute. It's been something. It's been a lot of media, obviously, a lot of uh, uh, partner stuff, uh, a lot of traveling. You know, we went to New York there for 24 hours, and then it's just been a lot of stuff. And then, of course, the Detroit race weekend was straight away after, so it was no time to rest up. It was straight going there, and then obviously coming off that win, I, I was in the lead of the championship, so it was not like I wanted to go to Detroit and run in the back. I wanted to 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 have a strong weekend there. So full focus there. Uh, but then, yeah, after Detroit now, it's been a little bit of downtime. So that's been nice to sort of get a try, chance to catch your breath. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been incredible. It's been amazing. The IndyCar has done a great job sort of uh, taking care of me, uh, but uh, yeah, exhausting in some ways for sure. I think Ryan hunter Ray said the same thing. He says it's the most memorable week of your life, but also the most tiring week. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would probably agree on that. It, it, it was amazing. And that New York trip was so cool. We got to do so many cool things, uh, ring the opening bell there on the NASDAQ and, and seeing your, your face on, on the billboards on Times Square and going up on the Empire State Building on a beautiful day and seeing all of New York and throwing first pitch at the Yankees games and all those cool things that it's like memories for life. So it's, um, it's been a, it was a super cool week. And just talk us through that, even from getting on the private jet, I think it was about one in the morning after the banquet to, to actually going to New York and seeing yourself on the, 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 you know, up on the billboard and, and then going to ring the bell at the NASDAQ and then, in, you're standing in the middle of the, you know, that famous stadium wearing wearing the famous jersey to, to throw the first pitch at, at the Yankees. I mean, at some stage you must have thought, I'm in a movie here, this, this is not real. Yeah, it, it was just like that. You know, like you said, uh, the Monday after the race was full all day at the track with the photo with like all the team and sponsors and partners and all that. And then loads of interviews and then like we rushed back to my apartment so i we live here uh, just outside outside indy so we rushed back and me and my girlfriend we just got changed quickly and we had to throw some stuff in our bags just because we knew we had to go to new york straight after the banquet and try find some stuff to wear for the banquet and then yeah we rushed back we had like less than an hour at home to get everything ready and then rushed to the banquet did that and then Straight away when that was finished, go to the to the airplo, uh, airport and jump on that uh, private jet to New York. And yeah, we I think we got into New York to to the air, uh, the hotel at like three a.m. and then at seven a.m. it was wake up call for for the full day of things in New York. So it was just so full on. And um, yeah, I never really got a chance to realize what was, what was happening. But it, like you said, it felt like you were in a movie. It was just uh, surreal. But uh, yeah, I was really happy to have my girlfriend Iris with me as well to share that uh, with her. It was uh, super special. Yeah, watching her reaction as well as you cross the line and the, and the laps leading after the red flag. She was she was definitely rooting for you. So, so that must have been a magical experience to, to share that with her. Looking at the baseball pitch, have you ever held a baseball? <laughs> Did you actually practice? No, I'd never thrown a baseball. And... Uh, People were like sending me clips and people like messing it up and like, don't do this, you can't do that, and blah, blah, and like, don't try to hit it, like, throw it hard because you're gonna throw it down in the, in the dirt, and like, all these like scenarios they were playing up to me, and I'd never thrown one and never got a like chance to practice or anything. So I was standing there and like, hmm, this make they make it sound a lot more difficult than just throwing a ball to someone, but um, yeah, I, I, I definitely have to work on my throw. That was very. It was, yeah, but he made it to the guy. He had to take a few steps to sort of catch it, but he didn't hit the dirt before. So that I guess that makes it okay. Um, 
Iris still put a video of me on her Insta story saying I throw like a girl. So yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> it was the best you, throw. You, but, hey. you live to, to not be an internet sensation for all the wrong reasons there. Well done, buddy. Yeah, thank you. So going back to, to the 500, I mean, obviously really strong month of May for Chip Ganassi as a whole. You went into that race thinking you could win the 500, that you're in with a chance. But when did you actually really think this is on? Yeah, so like you said, the whole month, I think we were we were the team to beat. You know, Ganassi, they, I, I said that multiple times, you know, that just putting five cars on the grid for the 500, I think is an achievement in itself. But to put five cars that all had the speed to win, I think that was incredible. And I think we showed that from like day one. All five of us was always running in the top 10 or top five. And we were really, really strong. Uh, the cars felt really good. And uh, obviously, after coming off the qualifying weekend, when we had four cars in the past six, and um, we knew going into the race, we were going to have a really strong chance. But as we all know, you know, the 500 is such a special race, and there's so many things happening throughout the race. So being fast is just a small part of, of winning the race. Um, but I had a clear game plan going into the race. I, I, you know, it was my first fourth time doing the 500, and uh, every year I'd mess something up or something had happened that uh, ruined my chances. So... I tried to learn from that and I spent a lot of the off season sort of studying 500 races from previous years to see how the race plays out. Uh, also talked a lot with Dario and TK and Dixie and those sort of experienced guys before. So I had a clear plan that, you know, the first 150 laps, I'm just going to run here in the top five, top four, just run there, make the fuel numbers, take care of the tires, protect my race car and not take any risk. Just run up front and then like the last stint and a half really turned things on and that was a cool thing like I, I managed to follow that plan almost perfectly we had a one hiccup in one of the pit stops where jimmy came into the box and i was gonna leave so i had to stop and wait for him and that dropped us from third to eight and you know when that happened i was a bit worried because i mm, this might be difficult to get back up because we saw how difficult when you get a bit in the pack it was difficult to make passes um so that was the only part of the race where i was a bit sort of worried that we might not have a chance to win this, but then managed to pick up a few guys quite quickly and get ourselves back in the sort of top five, top six. And, and then the last 50 laps, I knew I had the car that, that could do it. So then I knew it was on. And didn't you have a chat with Dario the night before about the last few laps? And did that, did that advice ring true? And you really did find yourself in a dogfight at the end there. Yeah, it's it's so funny because yeah, the night before me and me and Iris, we bought some some sushi takeaway and and sort of brought to the infield there because you know we all we all have our RVs there uh, on the speedway, and we were just sitting there at at the back, and then Dario was there and some other people, and and I was just sitting talking to Dario, and we talked about last year with Alex and Helio, what happened there, and then. And I asked him specifically, I said, if I lead with a couple of laps to go, what, what should I do? And he was like, yeah, you need to, you know, break the draft and do, you know, remember Simon in 19, what he did, you need to do that or even more, you know, you need to do everything. It's, it's just, you know, you, you just have to use everything. And we, we just talked about that scenario. And, and then, yeah, when that red flag came out and I was sitting there pit lane, I was just thinking about that conversation and like, yeah, this is exactly what we talked about last night so i just tried to use all that information and experience that dario shared with me and and just tried to make a plan in my head before we we went green again and i executed that plan exactly the way i wanted and it, i mean it was extremely close but it was it was enough when the red flag came out you're in such a strong position how difficult was that mentally or did you just had or was there an, an element at all to your mindset that just thought crikey how's that happened it was tough like I um, obviously with like 15 to go I had that three second gap to Pato and my car was really fast super well balanced and I could you know they kept updating me every lap and I could tell that they, he didn't close on me he was like closing less than a tenth a lap so he was not gonna catch us we you know I was counting down the laps and I hearing the gaps I knew he was not gonna catch us um and the only thing that was gonna stop us at that point was a caution 
but that was the thing. I know how, you know, how easy it is for someone to, to crash. So I was not, you know, taking anything for, for granted and, and was counting down the laps, but you really just praying for, for, for no caution. And then when that happened, you know, I was very upset, uh, especially when I saw it was, it was Jimmy, it was one of my teammates and, and I just, yeah, I went, I almost lost it a bit there on the re a red flag because I was like, I was on the radio. I'm like, I can't believe this. How is this possible? <laughs> Didn't anyone tell him that, it, you know, we're leading with three seconds. We cannot take any risks. And, you know, I, I know no one crashed on, on purpose, obviously. So it was, you know, I was not angry on Jimmy. I was just angry at the situation and I was really frustrated for a couple of minutes. But then I had Mike, my strategist, and and Brad coming on the radio, and they were like, "It's your day. You're, you know, you're the guy. You're gonna do it. It's, it's you know, you have the car. You have the the ability to do this." And they were really helping me to sort of calm myself down a bit. And then I actually, I ended up saying to myself, "Look, it's it's the biggest race in the world. It's not supposed to be easy. And this is just another challenge that you have to overcome to to be the champion." And I sort of just try to get back into the zone and manage to get back into the zone. And then, like I said, I, I made this plan in my head exactly where I wanted to make the restart, exactly how I wanted to swerve down the straights and place the car. And like, I, I had that, I sort of, re, you know, played it in my head a few times, even before the green came. And, and, and those minutes really helped me um, get that sharp focus that I needed. Yeah, I think the, the very best they can be the best that they can be in the biggest moments of their career. And it looked like that from, from the outside. You had the opportunity. You'd never been in that situation. And you look cool, calm, and collected. The restart was phenomenal. So we'd seen restarts analysing the race and commentating where they hadn't got the best of starts and they were fanning out down into turn one. But your restart was, was phenomenal. And that just gave you that sort of break and it, and it was a lap before Pato came back at you when he was side by side into turn one he said straight after the race listen I backed out because I didn't think Marcus was going to back out and it, and it kind of looked like that what were you thinking there I had again like I had that plan to to swerve because I knew he was going to have one run either you know on the restart or, or the next lap because I knew it was two lap shootouts so like you said I managed to really perfect the restart so I got that jump so he couldn't attack me into one on the restart which was good because like all day people had been pretty much every time the leader had been overtaken on the restart so, so that was really important to get that and sort of have the first lap covered but then I could see down the back straight that he was just coming on the, in the drafter so through three and four when you cannot do much with your line he was just eating me up so uh, yeah I, I did as much Sort of snaking down the straight as possible and then i knew i had to park it on the inside going into one because i knew my car was good enough to keep flat even entering really low so that's why you know i i parked it down the inside lane so he had to go around the outside and then i was i was committed to stay flat and you know if he was going to pass me he had to go on the high side and keep it flat as well and obviously that's a really you know high risk move and uh he backed out of it, which was good for me. Um, I think it would have been really hard for him to make it stick, but uh, you never know, right? But yeah, I was committed to keep my foot down. Um, some people were saying I was going to put him in the fence. I would not have put him in the fence, but I would have kept my foot down and, and you know, kept my inside line. And, and he would have had to make it stick on the outside, which, yeah. Uh, like I said, I think that was a high risk move that he probably wisely backed out of. Especially with the tyre life, we saw a lot of the incidents near the end of the stint life for the tyres and obviously Jimmy Johnson's incident no different. And I think with the tyre life that, that you had there, obviously you had a phenomenal balance. He, he probably wasn't as confident, but we'd heard him on the radio during the red flag talking to Taylor Kyle and being really surprised about your pace. So he was actually saying, man, he was so far from you. So... It, it almost came across as like you had the weaponry in your armory. And if you were going to be able to hold it flat down on that lower groove, that there, there was nothing really that he had for you. Yeah. And, and I think that was another one of the cool things that actually me and TK talked about after the race that, you know, both of us became so strong in the last uh, stint and a half. And I think the McLaren guys, they had no idea what was coming for them. And I think the cool thing with that was that, 
pretty much all race, like the first 150 laps, I was on fuel save mixtures and just waiting. You know, I was just sitting there and waiting for the last 50 or 40 laps. And that was the thing until those last laps, I didn't switch to full rich fuel until then. So I think when we did that and went sort of full, full power, I think they, they were shocked, you know, the, the, the pace we had when I passed Pato and Felix there after the last stop and sort of pulled that three second gap. I think they, they didn't see that coming for sure. And, and I think that was what uh, got them a bit surprised because I don't think they expected us being that fast. No, it was a phenomenal performance. I actually had you and Alex as my pick beforehand. So, uh, good man. <laughs> so, it, do you know what? What really swayed it for me was your pace on the opening qualifying run in those difficult conditions. That was really impressive where no one was really going quicker and you went and put your car into, into the slot to, to make the second day. And that, that for me showed that you had something good underneath you. Yeah, I agree. I think that, that on, on qualifying day one, that run that we did, at the very heat of the day, uh, it was windy and, and really hot and slick. And, and to manage to do that run, I, I honestly think that was the best run of that day of, of qualifying. So that showed that my car was really, really good. And, um, and to be honest, all month, you know, I don't think I was, I think ninth was the worst result in a session all month. And, and most of them I was in the top five. So as we all know, you know, practice days and stuff like that, it's, you know, the times of the speeds are not super representative because you know, it's a lot about toes and stuff, but at the same time, if you're always fast every single session, it got to mean something. And, and we knew that our cars were really good. And I could tell when I was in traffic, how strong we were compared to a lot of other cars. So we, we knew we had a good chance, but, but again, it's such a special race. So it's so hard to, to still pull it off. So looking at the whole month, if you could pick the most memorable moments, I'm sure that's quite difficult. It was a first time win for you. A lot of your crew as well on the eight car, first time win for them. But what was the most memorable moment there for you throughout the whole month? Uh, yeah, I mean, everything that happened after the after the crossing the checkered flag, it's just uh, it's so many snapshots in my head that I have there from, you know, getting the milk on the podium to doing the victory lap and waving, waving to the fans, kissing the bricks, all those things. It's just... You know, it, you've seen that since you were a kid and been dreaming about that and sort of picturing yourself in, in that situation. And it's been sort of a such a big goal, I think, for everyone uh, that does this and, and to be there and, and experience all that. And, and also, like I said, I had my girlfriend, my family was here, my backer that's been with me since I was 15, my manager. Like I had all those people that's the most important for me in my career were there to share that win with me. And that was just so, so special. Obviously, the tradition is to pour the milk over your head. You can't not do that. At which stage in the events after the race did you regret that decision, pouring milk over over yourself when you're hot and sweaty <laughs> and that dries? Yeah, it took a couple of hours and it started to smell. I mean, I was I think I took the check the flag, was it 3.30 or something local time? And I was still doing interviews in the media center at like 8 p.m. So at that point, it was really starting to smell. The thing, <laughs> though, that was quite... Uh, funny now but not so funny at the time was at 8 a.m the next morning on monday morning we were you know doing photo shoots on on the on the stock finish straight there at the bricks and the team had they had put all my suits into washing apart from that suit that i uh, <laughs> wore the day before so like for all those photos i had to put on that suit from the oh. day before and it was so like smelled so <laughs> much of sour milk and like i was close to throwing up when i put it on and then like <laughs> But then after, after an hour, you know, it was sort of getting used to the smell. So didn't 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 bother me too much. But yeah, that was pretty gross. No one else was. Right. Looking ahead at 2022. Now, you've won three races. I'm not sure if you're aware of this. Alex Pelot has won three races as well. He's obviously won the championship. You've won the 500. But so much has been made of you being the man that goes under the radar. Almost a team leader now. You know, people talk about Alex Pelot as leading the team in terms of what he achieved last year and, and, and his pace around consistency. But if you look at the stats and also Detroit to Detroit bookended, you've scored more points than anybody else. Yeah, exactly. I think that, that is the, the, the biggest stat that I look at, you know, from, from Detroit last year to, to Detroit this year, I've been the 
top point scorer in the in the field and i think that says quite a lot um so yeah we've been very strong that detroit win last year really was a big weight off my shoulders i had not won a race for eight years until i got that win and it was just such a big boost for my confidence and i i do feel like a different driver since since that win you know i, I drive with a lot more confidence and and uh I've been very consistent almost, I think pretty much every race since then I've been in the top 10 unless I've been crashing or having some other problems. So we, we've been really strong. Uh, obviously the double points at Indy helps for that championship uh, 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 stats, but still, you know, we've been, we've been extremely strong and, and running up front and just got to continue that to, to try and get the championship because that's obviously the next goal now. And I, I do believe we have the car and the team to do that. So uh, it's going to be tough. It's extremely close. I think the top six is, is really tight now in the championship, especially the top four. But uh, we're in the mix. And, uh, yeah, we have a lot of confidence going going ahead. Yeah, you make a really good point about the gap between your wins. I think it was 2013, wasn't it? GP2. And then you have your five years in Formula 1 and you come to IndyCar straight away. It was eight races before your first podium with uh, Schmidt-Peterson. So straight away, you're in the mix when you come to IndyCar. How much did your stint in Formula One prepare you for IndyCar? You're obviously in the prime of uh, your form now. And what would you say the differences are between Formula One and IndyCar? Yeah, very different. Uh, F1, obviously, it's a lot about the team and the car that you have. It's such big differences between the top and the bigger teams to the, to the bottom teams. And unfortunately for me, I was, you know, Pretty much all my Formula One career, I was in smaller teams. I didn't have the budget to really build cars that were good enough to, to run up front. And uh, that is tough. You know, it was probably tougher than I expected. And I definitely lost uh, quite a bit of confidence running there in the back, even though you know that you cannot do much more than that because the car you have, I think it still sort of takes a beating at you when you're always finishing 16th or 14th or 18th. And, you know, that's sort of, when you do that for five years, it definitely make your confidence go down and uh, uh, I mean you always have to believe in yourself but I think that was definitely tough for me and, and it took me a while when I came to IndyCar to sort of rebuild that um, and also IndyCar is such a different series obviously one spec series uh, it's a lot about working with your team and your engineers to to really try and get the car to your liking and there it's been really good since I come to came to Ganassi in the start of 2020. I uh, started to work with Brad Goldberg, my engineer, and we've been together now. It's our third year, and he knows exactly what he has to give me in the car to get my full potential out of it, because that's the thing in the car these days. You know, it's so tight. It's so competitive that you need to get that car a little bit more to your liking, and that can be the difference between being winning a race or being P10. So it's really tough, but it's a really fun series because it's more... It's more about driver and, and, and team than, you know, the car. So I really like that aspect of it. And also I think with IndyCar, which is really cool, is that you have to be such a complete driver because you go to the super speedway, we go to the short ovals, we go to the bumpy street courses, we go to the flow in nice road courses. So it's like, you know, that mix that makes it so, so special and so unique as a championship, uh, which I really love. Right. I know you've got to go, so I'll just ask one question. Re Road America race is coming thick and fast. You go very well at Road America. Are you looking forward to this weekend? Yeah, I can't wait. You know, it's one of the most beautiful tracks of the calendar. I always like to call it the Spa Front Shops of the North America. It's sort of in the middle of nowhere. I think it's like a 35 minute drive to, to the hotel because it's like nothing around there but it's super yeah super beautiful and it's really hilly and a lot of elevation changes and it's a really long lap it's the longest lap of the calendar uh, for us so it's it's a fun place to be at and the track uh, produces usually very good racing as well it's some good overtaking spots and i've been running quite well there over the years i think my best finish is a fourth place finish um, but I've been yeah, pretty, pretty good around that place. And obviously with the confidence I have going now, I'm, I'm looking forward to being right up there fighting for the win on Sunday. Well, listen, Marcus, you've been a wonderful guest. And thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on Sky Sports IndyCar. We wish you the very best with this weekend and the whole of 2022. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.